let's just start by diving into cognitive decline. And is it, and, and I defer to you, Tommy, how you want to do this. Would you like to do this starting with the pathologic cognitive decline vis-a-vis -vis dementia? Or do you prefer to talk about it through the, uh, the sort of more ubiquitous age-related cognitive decline? So we can start with age-related uh, cognitive decline because that's pretty well described. So if you look across large population sets, uh, you'll see that with increasing age, you see a pretty linear decrease in standardized cognitive function. And that's across all the different types of ways that, that you can measure cognitive function, aspects of executive function, working memory. Um, and except for one type of cognitive function, which is historical memory. Uh, and that's probably because of the way that those memories are encoded. They're sort of moved from the main um, memory uh, storing machinery to, and they're kind of spread throughout the cortex and they're sort of protected from some of the um, changes that happen as we get older. But in general, you just see this steady decrease in cognitive function as people uh, get older. If you then trans translate that to what we might call some kind of pathological cognitive decline, which would then lead into frank dementia, which is um, sort of uh, a long-term loss of significant uh, cognitive capacity or you know, cognitive dysfunction, then you might see an accelerated trajectory. So there's some period of what we call mild cognitive impairment, which you can uh, diagnose with some standardized cognitive tests. And then eventually that will continue into uh, frank dementia, which there are many subtypes, but the one that probably people are most familiar with and are most concerned about for themselves is Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and there are probably multiple things that um, drive both of those paths, but in some individuals, there's this accelerated decline that then ends up in, in then having the diagnosis of dementia. Tommy, let's go back to the beginning of that and just make sure that we've given people a real sense of what cognition actually is. You know, one of the most common things I hear from my patients is some sort of complaint around memory. Uh, mm. So just yesterday, I was talking to a patient and he was lamenting the fact that, not lamenting the fact, I mean, he, he noted the fact that he had been recently remarried. He was very happy about that but said, you know, one of the unintended consequences of getting remarried is he just inherited like a hundred new people in his life, right? Because all of the <laughs> folks who, you know, were his wife's side of the family and her friends and stuff are now kind of a part of his life. And he said, um, I can't remember their names. It's the, mm -hmm. the ability with which I can meet a person, remember their name is decidedly different from when I was 20 years younger. So he's in his late fifties, contrasting this with being in his late thirties. So obviously that's one component of cognition. It, it, by the way, is hands down the one I hear people most complain about. I don't hear many people complain about decreased executive function, decreased mm. processing speed. I, I would suspect it's because maybe most people aren't pushing those to their limits and or we don't have as readily available tools to internally discern um, decreases in that. But, but can you just mm. expand more broadly on overall this both the depths of cognition and, and what it entails, but also this phenomenon that I'm sure the moment someone hears what you do for a living, they're probably <laughs> right up to you at a party giving you the same complaints. Uh, absolutely. And the it's very difficult, actually. You know, so you can um, define you know, these domains of cognitive function. You've essentially already defined them, executive function, which is... Um, usually around complex decision making, but you might, for the average person, it might be, you know, that time when you think about saying something, but then you realize it's a bad idea to say it, right? That's executive function. That's the, your, your prefrontal cortex is jumping in and saying, you know, that's a really bad idea, you know, even if it sort of flashes through your mind. Um, but then you have, you know, various aspects of, uh, short-term and long-term memory, um, Processing speed, uh, reaction time is, pr is probably um, important as well. Um, however, when you talk to individuals about uh, cognitive function, they obviously they have their own um, things that they want to be good at, right? So it's very personal from an individual. Yes, we can we can put do it, use a standardized battery of tests, and that's what's done uh, clinically. 
Um, but there's usually some aspect of function that they notice is declining over time or that they want to be better at. And then they can they can sort of put focused attention into improving that. And I believe that you can improve that pretty much any stage uh, of life. So that's part of it. And you mentioned memory. And of course, this is uh, something that the people will mention the most or will, and will notice in themselves. Uh, but there's actually two different parts to memory and it's it's different probably in, in most people, even in the setting of sort of standard age-related cognitive decline and in those who have you know, some kind of pathological cognitive decline. The first part of memory is encoding that memory in the first place, right? The information comes in and your brain you know, signals through acetylcholine and other neurotransmitters to actually say, this is something that we want to recognize and store. And that's the process that seems to be particularly lost in those with pathological cognitive decline. Uh, that's why things like cholinesterase inhibitors were, um, or, you know, and are still used in, in Alzheimer's disease because that helps to bolster some of those encoding uh, processes but through acetylcholine signaling. And, and this takes place pr predominantly in the hippocampus? Yes. Well, that's where a lot of the process starts. Okay. Um, but over time, you know, you can get you get a consolidation and these memories get may get moved around. Like particularly, like we talked about historical memory, they get shifted throughout the neocortex, which is basically the rest of the, the outside uh, of the brain. The, the other aspect is retrieval, right? There's information in there and it's getting it out. Um, and retrieval is, you know, retrieval speed is something that seems to slow down with age. Um, but part of it, you know, often we think of this as, as pathological part of it may be that over time you just accumulate more information and the more information that's in your hard drive the harder it is or the longer it takes to to bring out a certain piece of information yeah this is sort of the argument that arthur brooks used that as we're aging it's um you're as you add memories you're you're creating volumes in a library and yeah the more volumes in the library, the longer it takes the librarian to go and get the specific reference they're looking for. Um, how, do, how can we figure out the relative contribution of library size versus librarian speed when it comes to, <laughs> uh, you know, accessing these memories? Because um, I guess this is another maybe way to think about that, but the example that it resonates for me personally is I either meet somebody and can't remember their name, but five minutes later I can, or I want to, I have an idea. I want to sort of say something about it. And at the last minute I can't remember, but then 10 minutes later I kind of remember. So, so it's not that it's not there, but boy, it took me a long time to get it. So I think in reality, it's probably very difficult to pass all of these out. Um, and so I don't think we could pretend that, that we know exactly the relative contributions. However, some of this is certainly affected by other factors, and that's something that you can um, take into discussion with, say, individual patients or, or individuals who are concerned about their memory. So it seems like um, sleep impairment or some kind of uh, sleep deprivation or you know, suboptimal sleep impairs retrieval. So, you know, then that could maybe open up a discussion about sleep. Um, there's some uh, subjective stress seems to also play a role here. So I think some of it is accepting that your library uh, is larger and some of it is thinking about other factors that may be um, impairing or, or, you know, allowing for that process to be suboptimal such that retrieval um, is harder. Um, and another part that comes into play here which is, is also important and it, it falls into that same line of thinking is that as your library gets bigger, your librarian becomes more selective in terms of the things that they want to actually put on a bookshelf. So imagine as you've met hundreds of people in your life, thousands of people, you add a hundred new people. Um, it's very easy to say, do you know what? The first time I meet this person, I may never see them again. So maybe it's not actually worth encoding that memory and you become more selective in what actually gets stored. So that may be part of it uh, as well. And these are not necessarily pathological processes. These may be your brain doing its normal job of, well, how do I figure out what's worth storing? And then how do I retrieve what I've decided to store? This may be a question that goes beyond your level of expertise. So I apologize if I'm asking you something outside of the scope, but um, I guess what is a memory physically 
and <laughs> why is there a finite amount of storage? So if I if I I have an understanding of why a hard drive is finite, and if I only have two terabyte terabytes on a hard drive, and I keep adding you know video to that, eventually at some point there is no more storage capacity. I don't think I have enough of an understanding of what a memory is and why it would therefore have a physical constraint. So there have been, and I will uh, absolutely agree with you, this is, this is beyond my area of specific expertise. Um, but I know that this is a topic that is hotly debated, where uh, some people have said that comparing human memory to a hard drive is, you know, essentially, it's a complete fallacy. It's nothing, it's nothing like that. Um, and so there's, you know, we, we use it because it's something that we can understand. It helps us, you know, sort of apply a very complex uh, process to our own thinking and understanding of how our brains might work. But in reality, that is not how, how memories work. And there shouldn't be a limit on capacity in the same way that there is with a physical hard drive. Um, however, you might still understand that uh, there are uh, probably still a finite number of things that your brain will choose to um, to encode and store for the for the same reasons that it, it may you know you, you only want to have the information that's that's probably maximally useful for your survival for one of a better way uh, to, to, to think about it and then you know that that puts some some constraints on on how the system sets up what it decides to, to store and then retrieve my eight-year-old son last night was asking me these questions. It's amazing when kids ask questions you can't understand. You can't come up with an answer to. And he was asking me where the memories were in his brain mm -hmm. and how they get there. And I'm like, God, these are really good. Like when I was eight, I wasn't thinking of great questions like this. So um, anyway, I, it's disappointing that I can't answer my child's questions. Um, okay, so we've established that that as thing as time goes on, presumably two things are working against an aging individual. One of them not pathological, one pathological. So the non-pathological is you just have a greater reservoir of memories and your brain might be selectively choosing how to prioritize new encounters and new memories with some understanding that there's, you know, the denominator keeps growing and I have to be selective. But there's also, as you said, or I think as you're implying, <clears throat> there probably are some pathological changes. And whether we use the term pathology or not is probably controversial, but there yeah. are some age-related changes that are occurring that are also, for lack of a better thinking in our analogy, slowing down our librarian, reducing our librarian's vision, <laughs> uh, you know, some, <laughs> some, some way that makes it actually more complicated for us to do these things. What do we think is at the root of that age-related decline that is specific to, be it retrieval, computational cycles, processing speed, executive function, all, all of these things that we would all prize as important pieces, pieces of cognition? So the way that I think about it is that we know with aging, we tend to see a decrease in size or atrophy of the frontal and then the temporal, particularly the medial temporal parts of, of the brain. And the medial, the, the, the medial temporal lobe is where your hippocampus sits, as well as some parts of the cortex around it that support it, like the parahippocampal gyrus and the ent ent entorhinal um, region. And there are multiple schools of thought of why those areas of the brain may be particularly vulnerable. Um, some maybe because of their of their specific function uh, in memory or because they're deeply involved in the initiation and uh, sort of the continuation and structure of sleep, uh, which is obviously very important for memory consolidation and also various uh, processes of recovery and repair. Um, but there's also, um, you, if you think about the whole number of things that your brain is exposed to, um, th those areas of the brain seem to be particularly susceptible to negative outside influences and then also susceptible to you know, beneficial uh, sort of supportive processes like actually putting greater demand on those areas of the brain such that they respond and increase in their function. So when I think about the various buckets of things that are required for a healthy brain, for want of a better phrase, um, they are around uh, supply, 
vascular supply, supply of uh, metabolic energetic substrate. Uh, there are important things around uh, structure and function. So this could be a structure related to um, neuronal membranes, so the importance of, say, uh, DHA, omega-3 fatty acids, and you know, which are concentrated in, in synapses. They're very important for communication between neurons. Um, and then you know, mitochondrial function uh, as, as, as an important part of that. And then you might think of actually you know, placing a demand on those, uh, on those structures. So in most aspects of biology, the, the function of an, of an organ is proportional to the, the demands placed on it, so that you increase capacity. Um, but then that also requires some period of recovery, and that's where sleep and other things come, in, come into play. Um, plus, you might want to avoid negative outside factors. So if we think about uh, dementia, we know that there's uh, some risk associated with things like smoking, um, uh, potentially uh, air pollution, uh, chronic inflammatory or infectious conditions like uh, periodontal disease seem to be associated with it. So you want to have um, sort of this supply of substrate, you want to have good function, you want to make you know, allow that area to rest and recover, you want to avoid things that, that then may impact those processes and then sort of what I think is driving a lot of this is the amount that we actually um, you know, ask those regions of the brain to do which does decline naturally over time. Um, based on how we currently structure our, our lifespan.